you will hear a telephone conversation between an employee at a pet insurance company and a customer. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 6. Protect UK, how can I help? Oh, hello there. I'm calling to inquire about your pet insurance plans. Of course. Just give me a second, please. Sure. So, have you checked our website already to see the options we offer? I've had a quick glance, and I think I'm interested in the basic plan. Great. I need to just ask a few questions first, then. Is your pet a dog, a cat, or a rabbit? It's a dog. And is it a puppy or...? No, he's three years old. Right. May I ask, has your dog been insured before? I just adopted him from the rescue center last week, and I think he'd been there a while, so I doubt it. Okay, so you've had him for a week then? That's correct. Great. I apologize for asking this, but your dog... What's his name, by the way? Fenton. Fenton. Is that spelt with an F? Yeah. F-E-N-T-O-N. -N. Great. Thank you for that. So, according to the rescue center, has Fenton ever attacked, bitten, or been aggressive towards a person or another animal? No, not at all. Excellent. And is he a guide dog, or...? No, just a house pet. Great. And you said he's three years old. Do you know the exact date of birth? Oh, yes. It's on the adoption certificate. Just give me a sec. Um... It's May 19th, 2013. And do you know, has Fenton been neutered? Yes, he's been castrated. Excellent. And final question. What type of dog is Fenton? Is he a pedigree, a crossbreed, or a mixed breed? A uh, crossbreed, I think. Right. A uh, crossbreed... Wait, sorry. What's the difference between the three? A pedigree is a dog whose parents are of the same breed. A crossbreed is from two different breeds, while a mixed breed is three or more. Then he's a mixed breed. Sorry about that. Right, no worries. So, could I take your full name, please? My name is Peter Pishinger. That's P-I-S-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. Right, thank you for that. And what's your address? That's 27 Cherry Drive, NW8 3HD. Finally, a telephone number, please. 020-3634-7957. Thank you. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, you said you were interested in the basic plan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. May I ask, are you planning to switch insurance providers after the first year of your pet insurance, or is there a possibility you might renew with us? I haven't really thought about it. Why? The reason I'm asking is because if you plan to renew with us, it might be worth considering our premium or ultimate premium plan. With the basic plan, you will have to pay the same fee of £8 per month regardless of how long you stay with us. If you choose one of our other two plans, though, you will receive a discount for the first six months. You'll only have to pay £12 for premium and £15 for ultimate. And then, depending on your circumstances, you might be eligible for further discounts after your first year, depending on how many expenses you claim. If you claim less than £300, you'll have to pay the same as for the basic plan, but receive the cover provided by the premium plan. Huh. 
Is that something you might be interested in? I'll have to think about it. Is it possible to switch to one of the other plans later on? Yes, of course. You can always upgrade. Let's stick to the basic plan for now then, and then I might call you back to switch. No problem. So, what happens now? Well, first we would need you to come over with little Fenton so we can have a look at his documents and medical history. We'd also need you to get him to the vet for a quick checkup. All of this is standard procedure before we can proceed with the insurance plan. And then, when all that's done, you can either set up a direct debit in person, or you can call us back and do it over the phone. Right. And the basic plan will cover... Well, the basic plan covers veterinary fees, obviously, plus a few more things such as boarding costs, loss by theft or straying, advertising and reward, death by accident or illness. You can find a comprehensive list on our website, or I could forward it to you via email if you prefer. Thanks. I'll check the website. No problem. So, shall we book you an appointment so you can come over? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometres to 35 kilometres from the city centre, or by car 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, 
We cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. This is not to be confused with the Coffee House, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the Chocolate Company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the Fresh Produce Shop. A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat. So the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between three students who are preparing a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey guys! Oh hey Gail, you made it! Yeah, sorry. I was stuck at the library paying late fees. Have you guys started going through the data yet? Yeah, we've already collated it and we've started designing the graphs we're going to use in the presentation. Oh really? That's fast. Wow. Anyway, here's what we've got so far. Okay, so... Wow, 38% said they thought about quitting school in the first year. That's a huge number. Yeah, and only 10% said they were happy at school from beginning to end. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I thought the majority would be happy here. Well, just remember that about 30% of the school population are foreign students. And from the UK students, only 2% are actually from the area. So, I guess it makes sense that people would miss home. Yeah, but to want to actually quit school. Well, they didn't want to exactly. They just thought about it. OK, so how should we organise the presentation? What did you guys decide? Well, Kevin and I were saying that we should start by explaining what the topic of our research was and how we decided to collect the data. So. I'll start by saying that our topic was how first-year students felt a month after beginning school, 
and how their attitudes progressed and changed by the end of the academic year. So then we were thinking that I should explain that the population we want to study was obviously first year students, but because we need their complete experience from the beginning to the end of their first year, we'd have to actually poll students in their second and third year. And then we said that you should explain how we access the population. So I'll say that we got the permission from the school to go to different classes from different departments and hand out the surveys in paper form, right? Right. And that it took us about three weeks to complete this part of our research. So then we need to describe the three different areas of focus of our survey. So Lindsay can do that. Uh, say that the survey had three sections. The first one, asking just some general questions about the age, gender, nationality, and field of study of each student. Then the second one, focused on how they felt in their first six months at school. And the third, how they felt in the summer after their first year was complete. That sounds good. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 26 to 30. Okay, so let me see the breakdown. Uh, okay, so we've got an equal distribution of boys and girls. That's good. Almost equal. 51% of the participants were boys, the rest were girls. Right, and 70% of the participants were British, while the other 30% were... 10% were from America and Asia, 2% were from Africa, and 18% were European. We had a small number of Australians as well, 0.03%, so I guess Europeans were 17.97% if you want to be precise. Which we should. Anyway, and obviously the age was all 20 or 21, with a few 19-year-olds, only about 5%. No, wait, 4%, right? No, it's 5%, but... Right, okay. So Lindsay will describe the three sections, and then you, Kevin, you'll describe the demographic and geographical breakdown, and I... Uh, you can start with the graph, and then we'll all explain the data together. Right. So we'll put this graph up on the board and explain that most students experience some form of homesickness or mild depression in the beginning of their course. But we need to point out that by the end of the year, it was only 5% that still felt like quitting school. Yeah, but remember that we didn't actually have the opportunity to interview or poll any of the students who left school. So the information we have only relates to current students, and those numbers might be bigger in reality. Yeah, I guess we need to mention that. But we did check the dropout rate for the last two years, and it was very low, so at the end of the day, the numbers can't be much bigger. Yeah. Anyway, so after we explain the data and we show the three graphs with the background information and the responses for six months and one year, we should spend some time also talking about... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Oh. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35.
Okay, now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you are away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them. And it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education, as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance and from there to send data directly to a computer so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell.